Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the study that we are going to present to you originated in a larger ongoing project here at the Peterson Institute to try and investigate the question of whether China is locking up the world resource base. Locking up meaning uh, taking control over a greater and greater share of the minerals, uh, the energy, the natural gas in the world that has zero sum implications for other consumers, that there is a um, less access for other consumers. Um, now, on the demand side, we all know that Chinese demand for oil, natural gas, copper, coal, iron ore, et cetera, places a heavy burden on the supply base. But on the supply side, Chinese efforts to procure raw materials might exacerbate the problems of high demand or actually help solve the problems of high demand. So the test that we wanted to run here at the Peterson Institute, this goes beyond, as you will see, Latin America, do Chinese procurement arrangements solidify a concentrated uh, global supplier system, or do Chinese procurement arrangements expand, diversify, and make more competitive the global supplier system? That was what we wanted to test. Highly unusual for social science, we did not know the answer before we started the investigation. Uh, we were willing to live with either outcome, depending on, uh, uh, on, on what we discovered. Now, there are four kinds of typical procurement arrangements. Uh, China foreign investment can take a special relationship with a major producer in the terms of an equity stake, or special relationship with the competitive fringe in terms of an equity stake. Those are two categories. Uh, the, the other two categories, or they can loan capital to a major producer to be repaid in output. This is solidifying their control over a given structure of production. Or they can loan capital to the competitive fringe to be replay, repaid in output. Uh, what we did first was look at the 16 largest Chinese investments all around the world, in Latin America to be sure, but in Africa, in Asia. And what we discovered of these 16 largest, 13 were with the competitive fringe. Three helped consolidate, but 13 actually helped to multiply and diversify the sources of supply. Uh, I checked for selection bias, so I then looked at four, uh, at, at five smaller Chinese investments to see if, uh, if maybe uh, we were off course. But four of these five also helped to make the um, supply base more competitive and more diverse. Then in this study, which you have, we looked at, uh, we, Julia, looked at the universe of all significant natural resource investments. That's 34 um, in Latin America. And once again, we found that 25 of the, th of the 34 helped diversify and make more competitive. Um, in, in, in retrospect, this shouldn't be too surprising because it replicates exactly the behavior that, if you think back, one finds with Japan. Japan in the 1970s was intent on trying to develop special relationships with Saudi Arabia, with, uh, with other supplies, and really take a larger share of the given supply base. In the 1980s and 1990s, they did an about face. So now that if you look at Japanese investments, they're widely diversified, mostly minority shares or loan shares, and they also see their interest in trying to make the world supply uh, base more competitive. Now, um, please do not report this to Fred. The study that we did was extremely narrow. That is to say, we only looked at uh, 
at the structure of the supply base. And there are many other issues relating to Chinese investment that are completely unrelated to whether supplies are more competitive or not. So the rest of the story is this could be good news for Latin American host countries because it might mean that Chinese investors are more willing to take on fringe product projects, other projects that uh, the major OECD investors would uh, let pass by. But if, if, as we find evidence in Africa, uh, Chinese investments bring tax evasion, corruption, poor human rights and labor rights practices, poor environmental studies, uh, standards, then you would say, okay, it's making things more competitive, but there's huge negative externalities uh, related to this. So that is what we wanted to test uh, in more detail in Latin America. So to do that, um, we did our first case study was in the natural resources industry, and this shows why natural resources was an obvious um, industry to pick 69% of Chinese FDI in Latin America over the period 2003 to 2011 is in natural resources. Um, and of that, Peru is 10% of investment, so it's a relatively large investor, um, or a large investment destination for China. The case study, um, we looked at, we did a structured case comparison of two Chinese-owned mines and two OECD-based mines, um, two of them that began operations in the early 1990s and two that began operations later on in the 2000s. Um, I don't have time to go through all of the elements that we studied because I think I have about two more minutes in my presentation, um, but you can find them in Appendix 3 of the paper. And what we basically um, found was that, well, the cases, just to tell you a little bit about the cases, the Shugang Yero Peru was the first Chinese privatization in Peru, or the first Chinese investment in Peru. It was also the first mine that was privatized under the Fujimori regime. Um, Chinalco, the second case, is a Chinese, a large Chinese investment that will begin operations. It's undertaken the preliminary investment um, exploration and is starting to build up um, the mine, is scheduled to start operations this year. Yanacocha is a um, joint venture between an American company a Peruvian company, and it has 5% financing from the International Finance Corporation. The Antamina mine um, is an OECD-based mine um, owned by a consortium of U.S. and um, Japanese and European companies that started operations in 2001. Um, so of our mines, the um, three latter ones, the Chinaco, Yanacocha, and Tamina, are listed on international stock exchanges, um, depend on external financing. Shugan Yero Peru does not. Um, in terms of the performance, we found that the Shogang Yero Peru has been subject to fines for lack of transparency, for bad labor relations, um, for environmental issues in both of the periods. Um, Yanacocha started out in the early period um, with some labor and environmental issues. Antamina has been seen as sort of the platinum standard of corporate social responsibility in the mining sector. And looking at these um, issues, we found three trends that influence the behavior of mines in both classes um, generally in Peru, one was the changes in international standards. And so during the period that we looked at, which was from 1990 to 2010, 2011, um, a couple of key elements took place. One was the um, coming into being of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, the EITI, which sets international standards for reporting for anti-corrupt practices um, for the auditing of payments by resource extracting companies. And so um, companies that are 
um, members of the EITI are subject to some pretty stringent requirements. The International Council on Mining and Metals, the ICMM, was also set up during this time. This is dedicated to improving sustainable development performance. And domestically within Peru, a number of organizations have sprung up many of them bolstered by international NGOs that have increasingly monitored behavior in the international resources sector. Um, two main ones are the Grupo Dialogo Minería y Desarrollo Sostenible, which is active in monitoring um, sustainable development issues, and also a forum for discussion between people working in the mines, um, the mining companies and the government, both at the regional and at the federal level, which is important in Peru since decentralization in, in 2002. Um, and also the Grupo Propuesta Ciudadana, which ranks companies by transparency um, and has a, has a very large presence in this. In terms of Peru itself, um, there have also been changes in the way that Peru, Peru um, regulates behavior by mining companies. A couple of the major initiatives are um, the Canon Minero, which requires um, companies, which takes a certain percentage of firm revenue and distributes it to the locally affected population. Um, in 2006, a corporate social responsibility program was made into law under which companies are required to collaborate um, and to um, and dialogue with the people in the locally affected populations. This is supplemented by the Mining Solidarity with the People, PMSP programs, um, which is a voluntary contribution by mining companies um, that has, there's a sort of unwritten agreement, this is voluntary, in lieu of increased taxes on mining companies. And then lastly, in 2010, the Peruvian Congress approved a law on the right of prior consultation for indigenous or native peoples, which requires extensive consultation with native peoples in the regions in which the mining companies operate. And most of these mining companies operate in regions that are substantially populated by native peoples. There have also been changes in China's directives which guide the behavior of Chinese companies. So in the mid-2000s, um, in the mid-2000s, domestic standards on environmental and labor um, relations changed, have become a little bit more stringent. And in 2007, importantly for one of the companies in our sample, the China Exim Bank issued some guidelines for environmental and social impact assessment for companies that are subject to the Exim Bank's loan projects. So all of these influence the behavior of the companies. Um, and so there is reason to suspect that the, the Chinalco investment will, see, will be very different than the Shogun. The Shogun is not subject to international stakeholders um, because they have their own financing. They are not subject to the Chinese Exim Bank directives. Um, they are not a member of the EITI. Chinalco is subject to Chinese um, Exim Bank, has international stakeholders, um, and is a member of some international fora um, for reporting requirements. And so the behavior of the OECD-based companies has had an influence on the behavior of Chinese companies, as far as we can see from our sample. Now, I put up the governance indicators in Peru, the changes between governance indicators in the early period to the latter period. This is very important. One of the takeaways from the study is that it's really important um, Government behavior in the host country is very important. So how well a, a country sets and implements, importantly, its own standards vis-a-vis -vis the behavior of international mining companies, be they Chinese or be they OECD-based, will have an impact. And so the governance indicators, um, voice and accountability has gone up. This is significant in the participation of the NGOs, which serve as a very good monitoring um, capacity for the industry. Political stability, um, the regulatory quality, and the rule of law, control of corruption, all of these are very important. And so if you have a weak, weak institutional and government capacity, um, then that makes it more likely that companies will behave 
badly. So the three takeaways are that financial markets bring accountability, um, the host country regulatory environment makes a big difference, and foreign investment is a catalyst for change. Well, how is foreign investment a catalyst for change? Here, Antamina's investment has really been seen as changing the way that companies do business. Their extensive corporate social responsibility programs have stimulated others to do the same. They've been one of the major participants in the PMSP going above and beyond um, what is really required. Required, and the type of programs that they've instituted um, have been designed in a way to compensate for the changes in technology that make it more difficult for local populations to get jobs in the mining companies. And so instead, they've implemented training programs, um, educational programs, and other programs that are aimed to helping the local populations be able to get gainful employment um, in, in other ways. Now, this has been a very brief account. You can read the details in the paper which has been distributed in your um, packet. Also, Kim Elliott has read the paper so that you don't have to um, and will be giving us some comments on this also based on her own research. Before I turn the microphone over to Kim, I would also like to give a shout out to one other element in your packet and that's the charticle which was distributed by our colleagues at the Americas Quarterly. Ambassador McClarty mentioned a lot of figures on China, US, China, Latin America relations. This is a wonderful place to go for some excellent sound bites and some more in-depth analysis on China, Latin America relations. So I encourage all of you to take a look at this. And when you do, you'll be so excited that you'll want to buy a copy of America's Quarterly, which is available out front. And so now um, I will, with some trepidation, hand it over to Kim for comments. On Uh, no trepidation required at all. Um, I do have to start with a caveat, though, and apologies to Ted. Uh, Barbara invited me to join the panel today after seeing a, a blog post that I did on uh, Apple in China and, and the New York Times articles and, and the uh, This American Life story that was done. Um, and so I, I have sort of focused in, in reading the article and in my thoughts and in my own work on sort of some of the CSR and standards um, issues. And I think what's, what's great about the paper and the article um, is there has been a lot of attention to standards and practices in China and less, although it is growing, but less about China's behavior on some of the, especially on the standards issues um, as it goes out into the world as, as an investor. And so I think the uh, paper is really useful on that, um, as well as on the concerns that Ted addresses around um, supply issues. But I'm going to focus um, on, on the CSR, and I, um, and I think this is sort of the beginning of getting some systematic info. We have lots of anecdotes, particularly about China and Africa, very little on China anywhere else in the world. So this is really a great, um, great start on that. Um, and what I thought I'd do just very quickly is to just talk a little bit about sort of um, from the perspective of the host government, what, you know, sort of how would they want to think about these issues and their responses. And then secondly, you know, sort of what are the incentives for foreign investors expanding on the last part of, of Barbara's presentation there, the incentives to behave internationally. Um, and just the first thing I would say is, and you know, CSR is kind of this broad umbrella term, but I think that it's really useful to divide up the different pieces that often go under that umbrella, because from the perspective of the host government, how you tackle those could be very different. The incentives to behave are very different. And so um, philanthropy also get, often gets thrown under that umbrella, and I would sort of put that aside, right? That philanthropy's fine, that can do good things, but it doesn't change fundamentally how the, com the company behaves. And so I think that's, that's a little bit, they can do whatever they want in philanthropy, but I think, you know, that's not necessarily a, a major concern. Um, the, really, the concerns, I think, are the, the labor and environmental standards, um, which are a core to how the company behaves. And then there's this employment issue, um, which I, I maybe, Ted, if we, I don't know if we're going to have time for discussion, but could comment on whether it seems as though this issue of China importing workers to, to work in its investments seems unique. I'm not really aware that of other um, uh, home country investors um, that do that as much as China does. And so I think clearly that jobs are a major reason that countries want foreign investment. And so that seems to me a key issue that maybe is unique about China. Um, and then the other two, labor and environment, also often get lumped together. Again, I think those need to be disaggregated because the incentives around how companies respond to 
uh, labor and environment regulations and standards are, are very different often. Um, so just to sort of lay that out as, as you know, um, the heading and then, so what are the incentives um, to behave? And, and these, some of these are in the paper and I think generally they fall under um, sort of four categories. You know, one, and I would agree that this is critical, is the host country regulatory environment, including, and this is what I, I think comes out of the paper in the case of Peru, the, the role of civil society and whether or not you have enough openness for civil society local groups to be able to engage and, and to have their, their concerns be um, brought forward. Um, second it is home country law, which again is going to differ in different areas. Increasingly now at the UN Convention Against Corruption and the OECD um, Convention Against Transnational Bribery, there are, there's more enforcement in home countries of their com company's behavior with respect to corruption when they go abroad. Um, but obviously that varies significantly across countries. Then you also have sort of uh, three and four are really kind of linked. You have home country norms. You know, how do countries behave at home, and um, I'm sorry, how companies behave at home, and probably, you know, it's likely there could be some links to how they behave when they go abroad. But that in turn is probably linked to what I call consumer demand for standards, which I would define broadly, right? You have, in some cases, like with Apple, potentially, you know, iPhone owners deciding they don't want to have, you know, the iPhone or the iPad anymore, but it could also be, uh, Barbara talked about financial markets, it could be pension funds, it could be other investor groups um, that bring pressure on either the company itself or intermediaries like um, financiers, banks, or other funds that invest in the companies to make sure that they're following certain standards. So if you think about those four kinds of incentives to behave, or those four categories of incentives, I think you know you could argue things are changing, but all the three at least that, that are outside of the host country, which is, again I would say is the most important. The other three are relatively weak in China. Um, it has lots of books on the laws, and it recently did a labor law reform as well as as the XM Bank that, that Barbara talked about. Some of these things, things on the books, but enforcement is a whole other issue. And, and China is pretty weak in general on enforcing environmental and labor and corruption laws. So you would expect that it might be pretty weak in putting pressure on its companies overseas. Um, similarly, sort of the same thing, I mean, that relates to the norms. And then finally, with consumer demand, there I think you can also divide it into is what the foreign investor um, is, is producing, or in the case of mining, extracting, is it for local demand, is it going to be exported back home, or is it going to be exported back to third markets? And that in turn, I think, will, will shape then what's the role of the consumer demand. Um, in China, there may not be, there's enough consumer demand or growing consumer demand in China to fix their own labor and environmental and other regulations. There may not be enough sort of attention to what's going on in, in other countries when those commodities, especially when they're inputs into a final product, they're not the final product themselves. It's much harder to bring that consumer demand um, to bear. So that's just a, a few thoughts on what I think is, is a really excellent paper. Um, and again, apologies to Ted for not having comments on his, but I, that's great. And um, thanks very much.